Well, uh, thank you again. So over the past 40 years, we've seen major advances in surgery for congenital heart disease and uh, other forms of treatment. This has resulted, as we've alluded to earlier, in really more adults than children at this point with congenital heart disease. It's estimated that over a million adults in the United States have congenital heart disease. And at least half are felt to have some complex form of congenital heart disease where they have ongoing clinical concerns. But less than 30% are uh, seen by appropriate adult congenital heart disease clinics. So this brings up the importance of uh, transition of care process from the pediatric to the adult medical team. So a couple of publications have tried to address this. In 2008, there's a uh, comprehensive document from the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association that uh, addresses management of patients with adult congenital heart disease, and it includes some guidelines for successful transition of care. In 2011, the American Heart Association published a best practices document for managing transition of adolescents with congenital heart disease to adulthood. Um, however, with more than two decades of national efforts at these since these publications, there's really still felt to be an unmet need for this high risk population. So in terms of definitions, we talk about transition and we talk about transfer of care. So transition is the process of moving the care from a child-centered to an adult-centered health system. And the transfer is the point where the adult congenital heart disease provider actually assumes the medical care of the patient. And many patients drop out of active health care during this time. And it's been shown that lapses in care appear to be predictors of morbidity and, and uh, poor outcome, and particularly for minority populations. So a publication in the European Journal of, of Pediatrics in 2018 was a systematic review of qualitative studies looking at these issues of transition and transfer. And they found that up to 53% of young adults had not successfully transferred to an adult congenital heart disease center. So over the past decade, Several uh, organizations who are sort of key stakeholders in this process uh, have gotten together or within their own organization tried to address something to improve the process. So we spoke about the 2011 American Heart Association scientific statement on the best practices for the transition process. In addition, in 2018, the American College of Cardiology's subsection on adult congenital and pediatric cardiology uh, quality work group put out a paper on uh, young adult transition and transfer policy quality metrics, so a way that departments and hospitals could actually assess how they're doing and have a benchmark to see their progress. In 2018, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a practice-based quality improvement guideline that talks about six key elements of transition, which we'll go over. And the American Co College of Physicians recently created congenital heart disease specific tools for transition. So, the main thing that has been identified is a number of barriers to this whole process. So one of the barriers is with communication and consultation. So there's often a lack of communication or coordination guidelines and protocols between the pediatric and adult systems. There's sometimes inadequate communication from the pediatric clinicians, often a lack of medical records and follow-up recommendations once the patient transfers over to the adult specialist. Uh, the sort of correlate of that is that there's sometimes a gap in consultation with the pediatric clinician by the adult clinician. So if he or she receives the patient, not really sure what's going on, don't close the loop back to the pediatric specialist and ask sort of what are the details. Another barrier is in training limitations of adult medical specialists. So um, I've been in medical education for about 20 years, and I remember 10 or 15 years ago, a pretty heated discussion about who should be responsible for the uh, training of 
of um, specialists who will specialize in adult congenital heart disease? Should it be pediatrics or should it be internal medicine? And in the end, it's internal medicine, and it's now a boarded subspecialty or sub subspecialty of the American Board of Internal Medicine, but actually a trainee can enter it after pediatric cardiology training or adult cardiology training. Um, but there's often a lack of knowledge or training in pediatric onset conditions in adolescent development and behavior, especially for those trainees that have come through adult um, uh, training programs. People can have a difficulty in meeting the psychosocial needs of young adults with pediatric onset conditions and a lack of training and caring for adult patients who are reliant on uh, caregivers as often these young adults are. Other barriers are within the systems of care delivery, coordination, and support. There's often a lack of care coordination and follow-up, a lack of mental health and other supportive services needed by these patients with complex needs. There can be an unfamiliarity of adult providers with local and regional resources for young adults with chronic conditions. There are administrative constraints and lack of time and reimbursement. These patients are complex and take a long time to see. And there can be a lack of insurance coverage often for these young adults. Another barrier is lack of patient knowledge and engagement. Young adults very frequently lack the knowledge about their own disease, treatments, medications, and medical history. They've had a very high reliance frequently on their parents or guardians um, through this process and never take it on on their own. They frequently have a lack of self-advocacy, decision-making skills, and self-care skills. And of course, this can lead to poor adherence to care. Another barrier is that patients uh, and their families sometimes have uh, variances of comfort with adult care. They may have unrealistic expectations of these young adults and their family regarding the time and attention they'll, they'll receive from their new providers. Um, probably well-founded, but concerns over loss of a strong relationship with previous clinicians. Often the pediatric cardiologist has taken care of this uh, young adult now for 18 or 20 years, sometimes even starting in the prenatal period. Um, pediatric clinicians often lack confidence in the adult clinicians and the stylistic differences between pediatric and adult care and can sometimes inadvertently project these onto the patients. Uh, I think the feeling is sometimes even um, stronger for those young adults who have intellectual or developmental disabilities and how they may fare in the adult uh, health system. Parents often are reluctant to relinquish the responsibility to the children or the young adults. And parents are sometimes unaware of changes in privacy issues once the young adult reaches over 18. So the American Academy of Pediatrics came up with six core elements for successful transition and transfer. And these six elements are to create a transition policy. And this seems simplistic, but actually the lack of an official policy is sometimes the barrier in and of itself. Um, without a specific policy, sometimes it just the process never gets started. Uh, they talk about a tracking and monitoring system for the transition and transfer, a readiness assessment of the patient, uh, actual transition planning, which may include patient education to fill knowledge gaps found in the readiness assessment, an actual transfer of care, and then completion of the transfer itself. The American College of uh, Physicians has this pretty nice website called gottransitions.org, which is mostly a public facing um, website, but it has tools for physicians and healthcare specialists as well. And it has many, many resources for youth and young adults, as well as for their um, caregivers and uh, parents with regard to transition from pediatric to adult healthcare in general. And there's a specific page for adults with congenital heart disease and um, addressing some of the specific issues that those uh, young people face. So key takeaways is that the first step really is that institution and departments have to develop an actual policy for transition. Without a specific policy, the rest of the steps probably are never going to happen. A readiness assessment for transfer is uh, required. It has to assess the emotional age, the developmental age, the readiness of the patient to transfer. Process and planning is a 
ongoing uh, ongoing type of thing. It's not a one-time uh, event. Discussions regarding transfer are felt uh, in most uh, kind of areas or, or most most studies to start by 15 or 16 years of age, even if the transfer may not happen till 18 or 20 years of age. And interestingly, in other countries, such as the UK and some of the other sort of um, British systems, the transfer actually occurs around 16 years, and many of their older adolescents are actually cared for in these adult congenital heart disease clinics. Communication, as we've discussed earlier, is paramount between the pediatric subspecialists, the adult specialists. This can be a written form of communication. It can be a verbal communication. It could be some type of transfer tool. Or some people advocate for co-visits where the pediatric specialist and the adult specialist will come to sort of that uh, actual transition visit together and um, go over the care of the patient and complete the transfer at that visit. It. Technology tools certainly may be helpful. The transfer has to complete, and again, this sounds simplistic, but sometimes this is where patients um, get lost to follow up. They're not really sure if they're supposed to still call their pediatric cardiologist. Have they actually been transferred? They haven't quite established care. They don't know how to do it, and they sort of go for sometimes even years without um, the care. And ultimately, other steps may be important to include other systemic barriers, such as insurance issues, resources, education, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, great talk and a very controversial area. Uh, let me see if there are any questions. I do have a question for you while I read the, uh, the uh, chat line. Um, why do you think that the adult congenital cardiologist should be an adult cardiologist? Why? And that's what the majority of them now, except for few, they are actually pediatric cardiologists who continue to do some adult cardiology or adult congenital cardiology. Why not just dedicate a pediatric cardiologist to become an adult congenital cardiologist and period, that's it. What, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, so I think as you discussed, this is really a sort of controversial, and not meaning that it's um, antagonistic, but there's really not necessarily a best way to approach this. I think the feeling is generally that pediatric cardiologists, because of their wealth of knowledge, certainly have uh, potentially the best understanding of the congenital heart disease. But certainly as our patients get older and older, the pediatric cardiologist just does not function within the system of adult medicine and may actually not know other issues that are important to the patient, the other differential diagnoses for their problems, the acquired heart disease that they may develop, et cetera. So I, I think that there's never going to be a perfect answer. And, and I think that probably the most important is not whether the person is a quote unquote pediatric cardiologist or an adult cardiologist, but it's that they specialize or subspecialize in this area. Um, and they may come from who knows which sort of background, but like anything else, like the electrophysiology or the fetal cardiology or anything, it really probably is a sub-subspecialty within our field. 